The Red Sea, a mysterious and awe-inspiring body of water that has captivated humanity for centuries, has recently become the center of a shocking discovery that will leave you breathless. Imagine for a moment the unimaginable, the Red Sea, that vast and seemingly infinite expanse of water, drying up before your very eyes. And what lies beneath the newly exposed seabed? What could be lurking in the depths of this once hidden world? Get ready as what is found will horrify you beyond belief! According to Isaiah 11:15, 15, 15 God will once again dry up Egypt's Red Sea, making for an easy crossing. He'll send a blistering wind down on the river Euphrates, reduce it to seven mere trickles, none even need to get their feet wet. The Red Sea, also known as Al-Bar al-Amar in Arabic, is a long, narrow body of water that can be found on the southeast of Suez, Egypt, and stretches for approximately 1,200 miles until it reaches the Bab el-Mandeb Strait. This strait links with the Gulf of Aden and from there with the Arabian Sea. When seen from a geological perspective, the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba must be considered to be the northern extension of the same structure. The coasts of Saudi Arabia and Yemen are located on the eastern side of the sea, whereas those of Egypt, Sudan, and Eritrea are located on the western side. Its deepest depth is 3,040 meters, its largest width is 190 miles, and its area is around 174,000 square miles. The seawater of the Red Sea is said to be among the saltiest and hottest in the entire planet. It is one of the most heavily frequented waterways in the world, carrying marine trade between Europe and Asia, thanks to its connection to the Mediterranean Sea via the Suez Canal. This makes it one of the busiest waterways in the world. The color shifts that may be seen in its waters are where the name of this place comes from. After the blooms of the algae, Trichodesmium, erythium die off, the color of the sea changes to a reddish brown. The Red Sea is normally a bright blue-green color, but sometimes it is occupied by enormous blooms of the algae Trichodesmium erythium. Geology A massive rift valley cuts across the continental crust of Africa and Arabia, and the Red Sea occupies a portion of that valley. This crack in the crust is a component of a more extensive rift system that also includes the East African rift system. This system extends for almost 2,200 miles southward through Ethiopia, Kenya and Tanzania, and for more than 280 miles northward from the Gulf of Aqaba to form the Great Wadi Aqaba Dead Sea Jordan Rift. Additionally, this system extends for 600 miles eastward from the southern end of the Red Sea to form the Gulf of Aden. The valley of the Red Sea cuts through the Arabian Nubian Massif, which was a continuous central mass of Precambrian igneous and metamorphic rocks, that is, formed deep within the earth under heat and pressure more than 540 million years ago. The outcrops of these rocks form the rugged mountains of the surrounding region. These Precambian rocks are all found over the massif, and they are covered by Paleozoic marine sediments that range in age from 542 million to 251 million years old. The folding and faulting that began late in the Paleozoic era had an effect on these sediments, yet the deposition of deposits continued to take place at this time and apparently lasted into the Mesozoic era. The sediments that date back to the Mesozoic era appear to surround and overlap those that date back to the Paleozoic era, which in turn are surrounded by sediments that date back to the early Cenozoic era. There are numerous locations where substantial remnants of Mesozoic sediments are found overlying Precambrian rocks. This finding lends credence to the theory that a relatively continuous blanket of deposits was originally present above the older massif. The Red Sea is thought to be a more recent sea, with its evolution most likely parallels that of the Atlantic Ocean in its earlier stages. It appears that the trough in the Red Sea was produced during at least two distinct and complicated stages of land motion. Around 55 million years ago, Africa first began to break away from its former homeland in Arabia. Approximately 30 million years ago, the Gulf of Suez opened up, and approximately 20 million years ago, the northern half of the Red Sea did the same. The second phase started between 3 and 4 million years ago, and it was during this time that the trough that can be found in the southern half of the Red Sea Valley, as well as in the Gulf of Aqaba, was formed. This motion, which is believed to equate to 0.59 to 0.62 inch each year, is still occurring, as shown by the considerable volcanism that has occurred over the course of the past 10,000 years, by seismic activity and by the flow of hot brines in the trough. History Ancient Egyptians who were interested in establishing commercial channers to punt were responsible for some of the earliest documented exploratory trips of the Red Sea. A voyage of this kind took place around 2500 BCE, while another one occurred around 1500 BCE. Both adventures required lengthy journeys across the Red Sea. The book of Exodus in the Bible is where the tale of the Israelites' miraculous passage through a body of water is found. The Hebrew text refers to this body of water as Yam Suf, although it is more often known as the Red Sea. 
Exodus 13, 17 to 15, 21, details the events that took place as the Israelites attempted to free themselves from their servitude in Egypt. It was under the reign of Darius I of Persia in the 6th century BCE when reconnaissance teams were dispatched to the Red Sea. These trips helped improve and extend navigation by discovering many hazardous rocks and currents. A canal was constructed between the Nile and Suez, which is located at the most northern point of the Red Sea. At the tail end of the 4th century BCE, Alexander the Great led naval expeditions of Greek sailors all the way down to the Indian Ocean via the Red Sea. Greek explorers did not cease their research and exploration of the Red Sea throughout this time. In the 2nd century before the Common Era, Agatharchides gathered information regarding the ocean. Written probably about the 1st century CE, the Periplus of the Erythrian Sea contained a detailed description of the ports and sea routes of the Red Sea. The Periplus also includes an account of how Hippolus was the first person to find a route that went directly from the Mediterranean Sea to India. Since the Roman Empire gained control over the Mediterranean Sea, Egypt and the northern part of the Red Sea during the reign of Augustus, the Romans favored using the Red Sea as a trading route to India. This preference began when Augustus was in power. The path has been traveled by travelers from earlier states, but the Romans significantly increased the number of people using it. Products originating in China were initially brought into the Roman world via ports in India. The Red Sea was the only waterway that allowed communication between Rome and China till the Aksumite Empire blocked it somewhere around the 3rd century CE. The route that merchants took across the Red Sea was an essential link in the spice trade network during the Middle Ages. In 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte was accused of conquering Egypt and seizing control of the Red Sea by France. The engineer J.B. Le Pere, who was a participant in the mission, was responsible for reviving the design for a canal that has been envisioned during the time of the pharaohs, despite the fact that he was unsuccessful in his mission. In ancient times, several canals were constructed, but none of them endured for a very long time. November of 1869 was the month that saw the opening of the Suez Canal. The British, the French, and the Italians all had a stake in the trading posts at the time. After the end of the First World War, the posts were gradually removed from their locations. Following the conclusion of the Second World War, the United States and the Soviet Union both made efforts to protect their influence, while at the same time, the number of oil tanker traffic increased. The conclusion of the Six-Day War was, however, the blockade of the Suez Canal, which lasted from 1967 until 1975. Today, in spite of patrols by the major marine fleets in the seas of the Red Sea, the Suez Canal has never restored its superiority over the Cape Route, which is regarded to be less dangerous. This is the case in spite of the fact that the Cape Route is believed to be less risky. A miracle? The Israelites' passage across the parting of the Red Sea is considered to be one of the greatest miracles in the history of the world. Now, modern science is asserting that it has accomplished a miracle that, if proven genuine, is almost as amazing as the biblical account of Moses parting the Red Sea. Researchers from a variety of fields, including scientists, have spent decades attempting to solve the riddle of how the Israelites evaded capture by the pharaoh's invading horsemen. In a film adaptation of the Ten Commandments, which was released 50 years ago, Cecil B. DeMille utilized his own special effects skills to create the film's rendition. Now, researchers at the National Center for Atmospheric Research and the University of Colorado at Boulder claim to have utilized computer modeling to rebuild the possible wind and wave combinations that may have formed the dry land bridge described in Exodus. They say they were able to do this by comparing the results to the biblical account of the event. Just put the Red Sea out of your mind. Their conclusion places the Israelites' flight to the Nile Delta where it originally took place. The investigators come to the conclusion that a powerful east wind that blew overnight may have pushed back the waters off a coastal lagoon in northern Egypt for a sufficient amount of time for the Israelites to travel across the exposed mudflats before the floods surged back in and engulfed the pharaoh's cavalry. The simulations match fairly closely with the account in Exodus. Carl Drews, the study's lead author, said in a statement about how the study went. An understanding of fluid dynamics is required in order to make sense of the splitting of the waters. The water is moved by the wind in a way that is in conformity with the physical rules, establishing a route that is safe with water on both sides and then suddenly allowing the water to rush back in. Drews, who spent years studying the account of the crossing, relied on the research of other academics on the ancient topography of the area to reconstruct the likely locations and depths of numerous Nile Delta streams. Drews' findings were published in the journal Antiquity. He made use of computer simulations in an effort to recreate the circumstances that may have led to the drying up of the wetlands and the exposure of dry land. He disqualified the Red Sea as a potential location due to the fact that it flows from north to south 
which is not easily compatible with the description in Exodus of an east wind blowing the waters to one side. In the end, he came to the conclusion that consistent winds blowing in the direction of the east at 63 miles per hour over a digitally reproduced lake along the Mediterranean coast, close to where Port Said is located today, may have caused the waters to be washed back to the western coasts, so revealing expansive mud flats and producing a land bridge that would remain dry for a period of four hours. One of the most puzzling occurrences recounted in the Bible has been the subject of attempts by other researchers to reconstruct it. Previous research has theorized that a tsunami may have been the source of the Red Sea's quick retreat and advance, but this has not been proven. However, this does not square with the account given in the Bible, which describes a gradual splitting of the seas over the course of the night when a strong wind was blowing from the east. Other hypotheses include the possibility of a wind setdown in which intense gusts cause a localized reduction in the amount of water present. According to the findings of a study conducted in Russia, hurricane-force winds from the northwest may have blown away a small reef that was located close to the modern-day Suez Canal, which would have allowed the Israelites to pass through. Drews made the observation that the Israelites would have been obliterated by the hurricane-force winds. In addition, there is mention of an east wind in the book of Exodus. If you are going to match the biblical account, you need the wind from the east, Drew said in an interview with Discovery News. His findings, which were recently featured in the online journal PLOS One, are a component of a more extensive investigation of the impacts of wind on water evaporation. That's all for the video today. We will be right back with more such videos. Don't forget to give this one a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in our next video.